stand tonight if you would. I believe it's time for all of us to get in on that. Amen? Listen, if you're in this place tonight and you can sing that with joy in your heart and you know that the good Lord God above has blessed you. Listen, you're saved, born again. Listen, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You know you got a home and glory and you know that God's done something in your life. We ought to be able to sing that with joy tonight. And I want this choir to lead us in that. Just lead us in the course tonight. And let's all, listen, you're talking about, we're going to sing another congregation, but this is going to be the one tonight. I can tell already, I can tell God's in the house, that God's in the heart of the people tonight, and we want to sing for the joy of the Lord tonight. So choir, if you would, lead us in that. Let's, let's help them out tonight, amen. Sing like you got something in your heart tonight, amen. good to us as he has. Amen. We're honored. We're privileged tonight to be able to stand before the throne of grace tonight. Find help in the time of need. And I'll tell you what, if there's ever been a time that the church needs help, it's now. Amen. We've been saying that for years, but I find day after day when I get up, the further we go in this world and the older I get, the more I need that help every day of my life. Amen. And we're going to find some help in prayer tonight. Whether you want to come and get around this altar or whether you want to pray right where you are tonight as the choir comes down and uh, finds time for prayer, we're going to pray. Beg God's presence to continue with us tonight. And before we pray tonight, Brother Horton, I, I, I just met this dear uh, gentleman here tonight. He's with the Rock of Ages Prison Ministry here with Brother Hurley uh, tonight. I want you to come and get behind the microphone here tonight, sir, and lead us to the Lord in prayer and beg God's presence to stick with us tonight while we're in here tonight, sir. Pray for us. Those that want to, this altar's open. Yes. Yes. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you once again this night as we look to you to come down and show up and show out. Father, we're a needy people. We need your help. Father, more and more, we can get more blessings than we can count. But Father, every day, every day we need you more than anything else. We need you more than food for our bodies. We need you more than anything else. During this time that we're in, I believe it's this time that you say, wait upon me. And Father, as we wait to see what great things you're going to do, for you're a good God, you're a worthy God. And many families here have needs tonight. Many families here have come looking for you to show up and show out. Many families have come 
looking for hope. Father, you're the only one that can give it. Father, I pray tonight that you'll help us. God, as we go through this conference, that you'll be uplifted more and more. Father, you'll touch hearts that may be here tonight that may be lost and undone without you. Don't know what the shouting's about. Don't know what the praise is about. Don't know what the choir even sung about the blessings of God. But tonight they can get in on it. Tonight they can be the night that they accept you into their heart. Maybe a Christian here that's discouraged. Maybe a man of God here that needs an uplifting. Father, you're the one that does it. Now, Father, I pray, God, that you would touch hearts of everyone that's gathered around this altar. Father, I pray you would touch the hearts of the people in the pews. Now, Father, come on in. We invite you in tonight, as I believe you have already showed up. So, Father, continue to deal with us tonight. Be with the man of God that will stand and preach. Use him tonight and help him to preach to our heart. Father, we're weary people traveling through a weary land, headed for a home in heaven. And, God, we ask you to prepare us for that place. And we're sure to thank you. We're sure to praise you. That name is above every name. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I'm going to tell you what, it's always good when God's in the house. And I can tell you this, we can tell when he's not also, amen. But I'm thankful tonight that God has chosen to come and meet with us once again. And I'm thankful that you're here tonight. I appreciate our visitors being here tonight. I appreciate what God has done already today. This morning we had uh, 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 just a, a handful in here this morning, but we still had a bunch of kids in here today. And uh, I tell you what, Brother Staley preached his heart out this morning and evermore blessed our heart uh, through the Word of God. It really did. Matter of fact, uh, it was so good to me that as a pastor, I said, I'm almost commanded to ask you or, or command you to preach that again tonight. Amen. And I wouldn't dare do that because that's not my place. Amen. Uh, but I'm going to tell you what, what a blessing he was to us this morning uh, in the service. These kids enjoyed it uh, this morning. We had a great time uh, in this place and a great time of fellowship. And uh, I just thank God. Some of y'all need some air tonight. I wouldn't mind if y'all did turn that air on a little bit and get rid of that heat. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. And uh, don't, I mean, don't freeze us to death, but turn a little bit of air on anyway. And, uh, but I appreciate you being here. I'm looking for a great time in the Lord uh, tonight. I appreciate the good number that we've had uh, all week long. And listen, I think we've had a great number of people considering everything that's going on. Uh, amen, and I want you to pray for the people that didn't come or the people, people that are in fear to come. Uh, pray and continue to encourage them, uh, and maybe soon we'll see them back in the house of God where they can get comfortable to come back and worship with us uh, once again. So you pray uh, for them in just a little bit. Brother Staley's going to preach for us again tonight, uh, but it is good to have Brother Rick Hurley and uh, also Brother Horton with him tonight uh, from the Rock of Ages Prison Ministry. And we had talked about holding services in the morning uh, on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, but I think we're going to hold it in the morning also. Uh, at 10.30, we've had a good crowd of people showing up. These kids have enjoyed it. Uh, they've been encouraged uh, this week, I can tell you that. And so Brother Hurley and Brother Horton is going to take a little time for us in the morning, uh, do a little teaching and a little preaching in the morning. And so listen, if you get up in the morning, listen, Ain't got nothing to do. You got plenty of time to get out of the bed, fix your hair, hey, put your makeup on if you want to. You men just come like you are. It ain't going to help you none. Amen. And just put some deodorant on and come on. It'll be fine. And uh, you'll enjoy the morning services. I will tell you that. Uh, they have been totally awesome. But I appreciate what God uh, has done through it. I said to somebody today, uh, we went and visited another missionary today, a BIMI missionary that's here in town. And uh, just getting up in age, had a lot of cancer problems, surgeries this year and last year. And so we went and visited him. And I said, I don't know what I'm going to do uh, come Sunday morning after all the good preaching this week. I said, I may just have to have a song service Sunday morning. Amen. Uh, but we look forward to what God is doing and uh, what he's going to do through tonight and tomorrow night 
And those that have been here with us have been a great blessing to us this week. My heart has been stirred. Amen. If I thought this week that it wouldn't be out of the will of God uh, for me to just step down from pastoring, uh, I'd just take off to the mission field somewhere. I'm going to be honest with you, uh, but I would definitely want it to be uh, God's will. So you pray, and I pray, Lord, you get in on the service tonight. And if God tells you to shout, shout. Amen. It, it, uh, you ain't going to scare anybody around here, so it's okay. Amen. And so help us out tonight. Help the missionaries out tonight. Uh, support them. As far as announcements, in the morning at 1030, uh, and then tomorrow night will be our last service uh, for this week here uh, at the church through our missions conference. So I want you to reach out again tonight, tomorrow. Listen, you ought to have one friend. You can at least, listen, call them and compel them and explain the word compel to them. And if they still don't come, it means go get them, drag them by the hair of the head into the house of God. That's just redneck interpretation of it. Amen. And get them to the house of God and tell them you need this. Amen. Give them something that they really, 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 really need and get them to the house of God uh, for the morrow night. And I promise you they won't leave uh, disappointed. Amen. Uh, they'll, they'll be glad that they came uh, when it's all over and said and done. But we appreciate you being here. Love you in the Lord. And uh, God's just been so good. Anything else that I may need to announce? Go ahead, Mama. I am. We, we can. No, I'm not. <laughs> Turn them lights off, Mike, before I forget about it and get in trouble. Amen. Let me say this here. She's talking about, uh, n number one, let's, let's talk about this. Uh, and I know somebody's going to agree with this. All the meals and the cooking we've had this week, and I'm definitely going to do this tomorrow night too. Uh, we've been blessed this week for the meals at, at lunchtime and, and just trying to eat at night and things like that. And, and my wife, bless her heart, she's uh, been fixing meals at the house all week long uh, this week too for Brother Carl. By the way, Brother Carl got home safe today. He pulled out about 4.20 this morning. He had a seven-hour drive. He got home safe today. And we thoroughly enjoyed him, and he said to tell the church he sure appreciates the opportunity to come uh, and the love offering, and uh, so we appreciate what God has done for him uh, this week. And then this morning, we appreciate uh, our kids, and uh, some of the adults helped out too, but they came back up this morning at, after the meal today and after the service, and they came back up and cleaned, and Jane had kids running through here everywhere with vacuum cleaners and Windex and paper towels and, and uh, everything else today. So kids, we appreciate you doing that. I have appreciated these kids coming, we've had a great group of kids over here every morning uh, this week, and I've appreciated them. Some of you other young people, listen, get up in the morning, go ahead and get up and come on uh, to the church house and come be with us. Let, don't just lay around and sleep. I know you're not mowing grass right now because it's too wet. I mean, mow grass on Saturday when it gets dry. But uh, come be with us if you can tomorrow. But we appreciate everything that's been done uh, this week. Let me say this in case I do forget it uh, tomorrow night. Uh, most of our church knows this and the missionaries that are here. This is our first missions conference that we have ever done here at the church. We've been here 15 years. Uh, we've done revivals every year, most times twice a year. Uh, and uh, we've, we've, I don't know, we've had 27, 28, 29 missionaries on board here that we support. We've taken on missionaries every year since we've uh, been here. As long as I'm in this pulpit, we will continue to take on missionaries. Uh, and it's our first missions conference. But I apologize. Uh, I wish we ha would have been more prepared, to be honest with you. Uh, we wanted to do all the flags, wanted to do all that this year. With everything shut down over the last eight, nine weeks, we've had a tough time, tough time trying to get anything done, order anything, get anything to, uh, to get here. So we would have loved to have been a little more prepared uh, for the missionaries uh, and the conference, but we have tried to do the very best that we could to make it the best that we could have it while it's here. And I'll be honest with you, it's just been good to me uh, all the way. So I thank you for the effort that everybody has put into the conference this week in this short amount of time of getting back in the building where we could do uh, what we could do. And I praise the Lord that God allowed us to be in here and have it uh, this week. So I didn't want to leave that out. And uh, next year, listen, we may be able to step it up a little bit. And how many of y'all just like to go back to a missions conference next year? I've been to many of them over the years, and I thank God for them. They've always blessed my heart. But I appreciate that. All right, enough said for me. Michael, come on, we're going to take an offering. Uh, again tonight, and uh, while we're taking off tonight, tap the you and the girls, uh, come and sing for us uh, tonight. And as I said earlier, everything we take up this week goes to these missionaries. The church does not keep a dime for anything, for, for food or anything else. 
Uh, everything goes to the missionaries. And so whatever you give this week, we'll bless them along the way uh, to help meet their needs uh, on the road. So you give from your heart tonight. We'd appreciate that. But Tapping the Girls going to sing for us tonight. Mike, you come on. All right, let's get ushers to come tonight uh, while they're getting ready. And we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, bless her off. And let's pray tonight. Father, Lord, thank you again. God, just for another opportunity to be back in your house. And God, what a great week we've had so far. And God, we're looking for nothing less tonight, uh, Lord, in the message. And Father, we pray, Lord, you would take this offering we're about to receive. God, bless the gift and the giver. Uh, take and use it for your glory. And Lord, be with us the remainder of the week. Keep us safe. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. but I want to do something just a little special tonight, uh, if we can, before I uh, do that. Uh, Michael, if you would, come up here tonight. And uh, Brandy, uh, I know you got the baby, but you can either bring the baby or give, her, give him to Paige. Come on up here tonight. Today is Michael and Brandy's anniversary. Amen. And uh, I want to sing happy anniversary. And uh, I guess this is what Brandy was hoping for for the next anniversary since she's I'm not, hey, I see that look. <laughs> she didn't hear that, amen? Yeah, I thought, may, I thought maybe you was hoping for that for your next what? anniversary. Oh, no. yeah, okay, I all just right. I wanted you to announce that it's your favorite daughter-in-law's anniversary. <laughs> 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 it, he, said, he said, give me my baby back. Uh, my first daughter-in-law, did I do the right page? F first, uh, I, I just have first to watch my, 
I have to watch my words here. Let's all stand and sing happy anniversary to them tonight. Amen. I told her today, I said, I don't know how you did it. I said, but I know it's going to get better. He's going to grow up and be just like me. It's going to get better, so don't worry about it. Amen. But I appreciate that. I appreciate them. appreciate all Michael does for me here uh, at the church. Thank the Lord and how these girls work and uh, help us out. We praise the Lord for that. Brother Kidman, you and Miss Kathy, come on up tonight. They're going to sing one for us tonight. Being it's our missionary to the military tonight, I want Brother Kidman to come back and sing this song for us tonight. For this right here.
have those plates. Come back up here tonight. They're going to do one last song for us uh, tonight before we call Brother Staley up. And uh, well, have you enjoyed the music this week? Yes. All the songs this week. You make sure you let these people know uh, they sang for us all week long. It's been a blessing. I will, I will tell you. Let me ask this real quick tonight. Just real, real, real quick tonight. Make it quick. Anybody just got a quick shout out to the Lord that God's done something just great in your heart this week, magnificent in your heart, you just want to give him praise for it. Just a real quick thought. Real quick. Go ahead, Kendall. Praise the Lord. Brother Jeff. Amen. Thank the Lord. Miss Teresa. Praise the Lord. Isn't that awesome? Anybody else? Miss Jenny? Amen. Praise the Lord. Anybody else tonight? Real quick. Amen. When all hearts clear. Amen. All right. Y'all sing. Y'all sing for us. When I was lost in my sin, I remember well that night when the Lord saved my soul from hell. And I thank God every day for the grace he's given me. I've been washed, redeemed, and I'm set free. For the glory last night when the blessed Holy Ghost led me to the light at the altar where I prayed. Jesus washed my sins away, and oh, how sweet is the sound. I once was lost, but now I'm found. God's amazing grace still amazes me. There have been times I've walked away from the Lord. My sins were many and my heart grew cold. Fellowship was broken. I felt so all alone. Oh, but it didn't matter how far I'd gone. God was still faithful when I came back home. His grace was given and grace to me was shown. For the glory last night when the blessed Holy Ghost led me to the light at the altar where I prayed. Jesus washed my sins away, and oh, how sweet is the sound. I once was lost, but now I'm found. God's amazing grace still amazes me. And I thank the Lord for the glory last Night when the blessed Holy Ghost led me to the light at the altar where I prayed. Jesus washed my sins away, and oh, how sweet 
is the sound I once was lost, but now I'm found. God's amazing grace still amazes me. God's amazing grace still amazes me. Hey, I remember those right now that were still in shock when somebody said Mike Witt got saved, born again, washed in the blood. That boy's going to church, amen. And they said, it won't last long. I've known him way too long, amen. I know his past. I know what he's been. I know what he's done. But evidently, they didn't know the God that saved me, amen. They knew a lot about me, but they didn't know a lot about him, amen. And he was greater than anything they could ever think of in life. I remember where he reached down from and picked me up out of the Maori clay and put my foot on the solid rock. Hey, he established my going, put a new song in my mouth. I thank God for it. Listen, I thank God for what he did in my life. I remember the day when he came down and saved a wretched sinner like me. What a God we serve tonight. I'm going to tell you what, that stirs my heart, amen. That ain't stirring your heart tonight. I'd come run, get around this altar and say, God, I, listen, I, I was preaching some years ago. And I'll be honest with you, I was in a Church of God church when I was preaching. They called a Baptist preacher to come preach. Thank you, sweet. I'll give that to Brother Staley tonight. Don't let me drink out of it before he gets here. Amen. And I was preaching in a Church of God uh, church that night. They'd call a Baptist preacher to come and preach. Uh, Brother Kidman, and, and I said, hallelujah, let, I mean, let me go preach. I'm going to give them the gospel. I'm going to give them the truth. I'm good with that. I remember standing up preaching that night, and there was a lady sitting in the middle aisle in a wheelchair there that night. She had to be about 80, 85 years old, and I'm going to tell you what, I was a preaching and running all over the place, and she got in the glory. I run down off the pulpit, run, grab, put my arms around her. I said, God, whatever she's got, I want it, amen, because she was a shouting and caring. Listen, she knew she had something down inside from God, and she didn't mind shouting it out. Uh, in the glory tonight. Listen, don't think I didn't want to get a hold to it. Amen. We serve a big God tonight. A big God. I thought about Brother Staley while they're singing that song. The same song that they're singing. Some military personnel down the road somewhere is going to be to sing that song. They're going to get saved, born again, washed in the blood. And they're going to be to stand and sing that song in a church house somewhere. And shout the victory. Amen. Boy, it's good to have Brother Staley here with us tonight. I appreciate love him in the Lord. Appreciate what God's doing. He's going to come preach just a minute. Michael, you got, the, you got the DVD ready tonight? Amen. I pray we got sound. Amen. And so if you got it ready tonight, let's go ahead and start that thing up. And uh, he wants to just show that first, and then he's going to come on up and preach to us tonight. Amen. Start it up. are sons and daughters. They are soldiers, warriors, and defenders of freedom. They are the ones who fight while we sleep. And they are the ones who shoulder burdens that many of us will never have to bear. The men and women of the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines are known by many names. But most of us just call them heroes. Yet even our nation's greatest heroes fight battles they cannot seem to win. These are not battles fought with artillery, with aircraft, or with guns. They are not battles that are won by the side with the most firepower. These battles are spiritual battles. They are battles of loneliness, of depression, of anxiety, of anger, and of salvation. Statistics show that every 18 hours, someone in active duty will take their own life. The men and women of our military desperately need somebody to show them how Christ can give them victory. God has called Michael and Deanna Staley to serve as missionaries to the United States military. Both Michael and Deanna know how important military ministry is because they were saved while they served in the United States Air Force. The Staley family plans to use their 14 years of experience as missionaries to Peru 
and their seven years of experience pastoring Calvary Baptist Church in Tacoa, Georgia, to help them provide desperately needed spiritual help to America's heroes. God has given the Staley family five simple goals for their ministry to military families. He has called them to engage military personnel with the gospel. He has called them to enlist men and women in discipleship, equip people for service in the church, establish military churches, and endeavor to reach the world with the gospel of Christ. Our nation's heroes need the spiritual opportunities that each of us enjoy in such abundance. They need a family like Michael and Deanna Staley to instruct them in God's word. And they need local churches that will support these ministries with prayer and financial support so that they can take the gospel to military bases around the world. The Staley family is sent out of Vision Baptist Church in Alpharetta, Georgia and are sent through BIMI. Please prayerfully consider supporting Michael and Deanna Staley as they take the gospel to our nation's heroes. All right, we appreciate that and glad it worked tonight. I think it worked because Brother Kidman back there who served in the Army was not back there messing things up tonight. I think that's why it worked, amen. And so we, oh, okay, yeah. That's always what an army guy says, amen? And so, but we are honored to be here with you all tonight, and I thank the Lord for the privilege to be here last night, and uh, we appreciate your church, and uh, thank you for supporting us as we've been on deputation. I guess we were here in May of 2018, and so a little over uh, two years ago, and so we are looking forward to going to Spain. The Lord has opened the door for us to go to Spain and work outside a a Navy base there, and so we are excited. We were actually hoping to go June 1st, uh, but that has kind of been delayed with COVID-19. 19. And so we are going to be going as soon as we can get our paperwork done, as a few things done, and Lord willing, we'll be there before the end of the summer. But we are honored to be here with you tonight, and I thank the Lord for the privilege uh, to be here with you all. Uh, as the video said, every 18 hours, someone in active duty takes their own life through suicide. To me, that's a startling statistic because the military provides so many things. It provides the job, provides the job training. It provides the uniform, it provides the housing, it provides the meal, the, the food, the housing, uh, n- n- the hospitalization, provides so many things except the one thing that everybody needs, and that's to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And I believe a lot of that is due, and I thank Brother Kidman for his ministry because the statistics are that every uh, 22 times a day, a veteran, veteran of our United States military will take their life through suicide. And they need to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And so my wife and I's goal is to go to Spain and just to reach our military men and women with the gospel, share Christ with them. And we're just looking for the next Mike and Deanna Staley uh, that we can invest in, disciple, and see what God will do with their life. And so thank you for supporting us and supporting our ministry. Also, thank you for supporting our daughter and our son-in-law, our favorite son-in-law. Amen. And he'll always be the favorite because he's the only one one. And so, uh, but uh, they are missionaries uh, going to Ecuador and they're in Peru right now in language school. And I wanted to say this this morning, but our daughter recently wrote a book. And uh, if you look up at Bethany Bloom on Amazon, you can actually download it to Kindle for free. And it's a children's book about Jim Elliott. And so she wrote that. And so I hope that you'll go there and some of the kids, uh, make sure you have your parents go there and download it for you so you can read it. And he'll learn about Jim Elliott and learn about missions and so we are honored to be here with you tonight and be a part of this conference. Before we get into God's message tonight, I want to present this uh, to your pastor. Uh, this is a challenge coin. Uh, challenge coins go back all the way to World War I. Uh, when I was in the United States Air Force, we didn't have challenge coins, never heard of challenge coins. Uh, now they are a thing, uh, and the Army uses them quite frequently. But a challenge coin was uh, a wealthy lieutenant had bronze coins made up for all his squadron to increase the camaraderie. Later, one of his uh, men were shot down and taken POW. Uh, He later escaped and was found by the French, and uh, the story goes that he used his coin to prove that he was an American. 
And so when he got back to his squadron and shared what had happened to him, and uh, they made a covenant that they would always carry their challenge coin with them. And so uh, challenge coins have come and gone through the years. But this challenge coin just says, Michael and Deanna Staley, missionaries to our military, uh, and has the five branches of our military on the front, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and the Coast Guard. And then on the back it says, uh, Military Missions, B-I-M-I, Arise and Go, Acts 8, 26, Preach the word and reach the world. And so on behalf of my wife and I tonight, we'd like to present this to Pastor Witt and our appreciation for allowing us to come and present our burden to you and your church family. And thank you so much, sir. Amen. Amen. Thank Thank you. So just a small token of our appreciation. If you have your Bible tonight, if you go to Luke chapter number 18 tonight, Luke chapter number 18. And we're going to begin reading in verse number 31. Luke chapter number 18, verse 31. I've enjoyed the singing tonight. Thank you so much uh, for all of that. And uh, I knew it was going to be good when we started with the first song. Amen? Uh, Because I have been blessed, and I thank the Lord uh, so much for that. And thank you for his blessings on our lives. Luke chapter number 18, look at verse 31 if you would. The Bible says, and he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spit it on. And they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. This is Jesus telling his disciples that they needed to go to Jerusalem. And he said, here's why we need to go to Jerusalem. Here's what's going to happen when we go to Jerusalem. This is what's written in the prophets about the Son of Man. He will be delivered unto the Gentiles. He'll be mocked. They will spit on him. He will be spitefully entreated. They will scourge him, and they will put him to death. But on the third day, he shall rise again. What's interesting is that's not the first time in the Luke's gospel that Jesus had said those words. Actually, all the way back in chapter number 9, he said that he would rise again the third day. In chapter 9 also, he said that they talked about on the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, Moses, and they said his decease, which should take place in Jerusalem. In Luke chapter 13, again, he told them that he would rise again the third day. And he told them many times he set his face to go to Jerusalem. He made his way to go to Jerusalem. What I'm saying to you tonight is Jesus was on a mission when he came to this world. Many of us will read self-help books. We try to figure out what we're going to do in life, what we're going to become in life, what we want to do with our lives. But Jesus never had that problem. Because when Jesus was born in this world, he came with a purpose. He came with a mission. He knew exactly what his mission was. And he told his disciples here in Luke chapter 18, he tells them his mission. we got to go to Jerusalem. And here's what's going to happen. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to, I'm going to die on a cross. But on the third day, I'm going to rise again. It's interesting. And notice verse 34. How much of this did the disciples understand? Notice what it says. And they understood none of these things. They didn't understand any of it. And the saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. So Jesus is on a mission. He tells them, we got to go to Jerusalem. He tells them, I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to rise again the third day. And so they begin to make their way to Jerusalem. As we go on in the story, as they're outside of Jericho, as he's going to Jerusalem, he comes by Jericho, and there's a blind man sitting there uh, outside of Jericho, and he calls out to Jesus, and he asks Jesus, Have mercy on me. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Now, I don't know how many of you are like me, but when I'm driving someplace and I'm on a mission... 
There's no time for stops, amen? amen. You got to get there. You got to get there in the time. You don't have time to be going to Walmart and be going to big lots and all these places. You need to get there. You're on a mission, amen? You don't have time for anything. You have time to go through Chick-fil-A real quick, amen, and then get back on the road. I, when I'm on a mission, I'm focused. But here's something amazing. Jesus takes time for a blind man. Even though he's on a mission to the cross, he took time for a blind man. And he asked him, he says, what do you want me to do? And he asked for his sight. And Jesus says, uh, he gave him his sight. Receive thy sight. Thy faith has saved thee. And then he continued on his mission. I want to re begin reading in chapter 19. Notice verse number 1. Very familiar story. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans. And he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. Now, we all know this story. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Now, I always like to say, I'm not going to embarrass you by making you sing that song tonight. And I'm not going to torture you by singing it to you. Amen. But you know how the song goes, and it goes right along with the scriptures. And we sang that song all of our lives as Sunday school or vacation Bible school. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. And there's some very interesting things in this passage of scripture that I see. Uh, one thing is that Zacchaeus here was a chief among the publicans, and he was rich. Many believe he got his wealth from taking from others. And he was not a very well-liked man. Because he was a publican, he had to take taxes uh, for the Romans, and so he would take uh, from what they needed, and then he would take a little bit extra, put it in his own pocket. And so he would not have been a well-liked man. But obviously Zacchaeus had heard about Jesus, and he wanted to see Jesus, and he wanted to get a glimpse of Jesus. But Zacchaeus had a problem because he was short, he was small of stature. And so by the time he got to the road where Jesus was coming down, there was already people lined up in front of him. And so Zacchaeus was probably on his tiptoes trying to look over the top of shoulders. He was probably trying to look through their bodies. And he was probably maybe trying to look through their legs to get a glimpse of Jesus. And he couldn't see Jesus. And maybe he tapped some people on the shoulder and he said, Hey, sir, do you mind if I stand in front of you? And the gentleman probably said, Hey, get here earlier next time, buddy. Go on down the road. Isn't that what you would say if you went to a parade in town and you got there early and you sat out your lawn chair and you had a spot for your grandchildren and some adult came and said, hey, do you mind if I stand in front of you guys? And you'd say, hey, buddy, get here earlier next time. Go on down the road. And so that's what they told Zacchaeus. And so he goes down and next thing you know, we find him climbing up in a tree. Now, I say this, if you go outside after church tonight and some boys and girls are climbing up in a tree, don't think anything about it, amen. That's what boys and girls do. But if you go outside at tonight after church and Pastor Witt is climbing up in a tree, we have issues, amen. We want to know what does he want to break? What is he trying to do? What's he trying to hurt? What's his problem? But Zacchaeus wasn't worried about what people thought because he wanted to see Jesus. He wanted to get a glimpse of Jesus. So he climbs up in that tree. Notice verse number five. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus. Let me ask you a question. How did Jesus know Zacchaeus' name? Was it because people were yelling, Zacchaeus, get down and out of there before you break something? Was it because Zacchaeus' wife was yelling, hey, what are you doing up there? Get down. No. It's because Jesus knows everything, amen? Isn't it good to know that Jesus knows what you're going through? Isn't it good to know that he knows your name? And he knows what you'll face tomorrow before even tomorrow gets here? And he knows what you'll face on Saturday before Saturday even gets here? 
Isn't it good to know when you're going through a trial, Jesus knows all about it and he's with you? See, Jesus knew his name. He knew Zacchaeus' name. And he says, Zacchaeus, come down. I must go to your house and abide at your house. I love verse 6. He says, he, he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. Now, let me ask you this. If Jesus was here tonight and he said to you, hey, at the end of the invitation, I'm going to go to your house. How many of you would say, hey, time out, Lord. How about you just hang around and fellowship a little bit? Let me get a little bit of a head start because I want to clean up some things at the house before you get there. Amen. I want to turn what's ever on the TV, and I want to turn the radio, and I want to move some books and some magazines, and I want to hide some stuff in the closet. I want to get rid of stuff before you get there. Hey, you just give me about 10 or 15 minutes to straighten things up. But Zacchaeus didn't say that. He received him joyfully. Amen. Amen. He was looking forward. Now, notice this in the story also. Look at verse 7. And when they saw it, the religious crowd, they all murmured. You do realize that whenever you try to do something for God, there's going to be the religious crowd that murmurs. There's going to be the religious crowd that complains. Whenever you try to reach lost people, there's going to be people that will murmur and complain about that. Whenever you try to bring kids in on a van or a bus from a, a different part of town and they put their fingerprints on the walls, there's going to be people that murmur and complain about that. Right. Hey, listen, our goal is to reach people with the gospel. We saw it last night, how many people live in the world. How many people were born last night? How many people died last night? Hey, listen, we are on a mission, amen, to reach people with the gospel. And we can't let people that murmur and complain stop us from reaching people with the gospel. And so he goes his house. People murmur. And, and something happened to Zacchaeus, verse 8. He said, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. If I've taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Listen, I believe something happened in Zacchaeus' heart before he left the limb of the tree, before his feet hit the ground. God was already working in his heart. Because we're not saved by works, amen? We're saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Jesus invited Zacchaeus down, before he hit the ground, he already said, man, I've taken from people. I need to restore that back. I need to do some things that are right. I'm ashamed to say this, preacher, but when I was in the Air Force, after I got saved, I went through my house, and I had all these ballpoint pens, multitudes of ballpoint pens. They all said, Depart a property of the United States government on them. I would go to work. I would get a ballpoint pen. I'd put it in my pocket. I'd take it home, and I had all these ballpoint pens. And when I got saved, God convicted me of that. And so one day I took all those ballpoint pens, I took them back to the office supply at the shop, and I put them in there, and I said, thank you. I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I didn't take these. Now, I heard a guy that was in the Navy. He took a whole box of stuff and put it outside of his commander's door. He got saved, and God worked in his heart, and God said, hey, you have a lot of things that are property of the Navy that aren't yours. You need to return those things. And he told, tells in his testimony, when he set that box outside the commander's office, he thought for sure he would get kicked out of the Navy. He thought surely his career was over. And the commander called him and said, uh, Brother Stances, what is all these, what's, all these, what's this box of stuff that you left here? And he said, well, sir, I got saved the other day. I heard the gospel preaching, and I asked Jesus Christ in my heart and in my life, and I had all these things that didn't belong to me. And so I thought I would return them back, and I asked God to forgive me. And he got to share the gospel with his commander. Amen. He said, I was surprised. He didn't kick me out of the Navy. He let me continue to serve, and I was thankful for an opportunity to share Christ with my commander. So something happened to Zacchaeus. Jesus said, this day is salvation come to the house. Uh, he is also a son of Abraham. But I want you to look at verse number 10, if you would, and we're going to spend the remaining of our time there. It says, son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. That was Jesus' purpose. That was Jesus' mission. Some would say Luke 19, verse number 10, is the theme of the whole gospel of the book of Luke. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Hey, lost, that's a sharp word, isn't it? Have you ever lost something? 
Maybe how many of you have ever lost your keys? Yeah, you do that quite often, don't we? We trace back where we left them at and where was the last place. We lose our keys. I recently I have to wear reading glasses. I don't wear them very often. I try not to wear them very often, but I buy I bought reading glasses. I went to the the drugstore, the CVS, and I went to the reading glass section, and they had them packs of five. They had packs of three. They had individual pairs. I said, well, you can only wear one pair at a time. Why would you need to buy more than that? So I picked up one pair. I was about two weeks. I was back at that same CVS, and I bought a pack of five next time. Amen. I said, I don't know where those ones went. Lost. Have you ever been lost? Maybe in the woods. When we were in Florida, uh, right before we got out of the military, uh, we actually lost our son one time. We didn't really lose him. Uh, he was sleeping in a pew, and we were fellowshipping after church, and we were just having a good time fellowshipping. And next thing you know, we were out in the parking lot. And next thing you know, we were close to our car, so we just got in our car. We're driving out of Niceville, Florida, on our way home to Fort Walton Beach. And I look in the back seat, and I'm like, honey, I think we forgot something. There was no baby in the back seat. There was no little boy in the back seat. So he went back to the church, and the church was still open, and there he was, still in the pew, just spread out, sleeping. And so uh, he was lost, lost. Maybe you've lost your dog, your cat, lost. It's a sharp word, isn't it? Luke had told us about some things that are lost in Luke chapter 15. He said, uh, what if there was a certain man that was a shepherd? And he had 99 sheep, but one of them was lost. There was a certain woman that had ten, uh, nine coins, but one of those coins was lost. There was a man that had two sons. And one of them, you might say, well, preacher, he wasn't lost. That was his choice. That was his decision. But at the end of the story, the father said, my son was lost and is found. Lost, what a hard, harsh word. I recently learned even more about the word lost. I read a book about the USS Indianapolis. The USS Indianapolis was a naval ship at the end of World War II. The USS Indianapolis was a ship of a, a close to 1,195 men were on the ship. The USS, U, USS Indianapolis was, was given the task of delivering the atomic bomb materials to an island so they can make the atomic bomb. Nobody on the ship knew what their mission was. Nobody on the ship knew what their purpose was. It was, it was kind of deceived, and they had two army guys that watched it and they, the whole time, and nobody knew. And on July 26, they delivered their precious cargo to the island they were told to deliver it to. They later went to Guam. On July 28th, they left Guam to go to the Philippine Seas. Even though the war was almost over, the commander of the USS Indianapolis said, hey, are we going to have, uh, are we gonna have some destroyers that go along with us? Is anybody going along with us? And the Navy said, no, we don't have any room for that. It's safe. Don't worry about it. Just go to the Philippine Seas. July 28th, they left Guam. At a little before midnight on July 30th, 1945, the USS Indianapolis was stuck, struck by a Japanese submarine. Two torpedoes went in the, in the side of the USS Indianapolis. Over 1,195 men on the ship. 300 of them were injured or died before they could even get off the ship. The USS Indianapolis sunk, and as in, in 12 minutes, it was complete, completely submerged underwater. Over 800 men had made it out, on the sh out of the ship with their life vest, and some had life rafts and a few other life uh, protection things, and they were out floating in the water a little after midnight on July 30th, 1945. Now, you would think a ship sunk by the a Navy ship sunk, somebody would be looking for that ship in a matter of minutes. But the truth is, one day goes by, and nobody is looking for the men of the USS Indianapolis. They said it would be during the day, it would get so hot. It, one man said it was like you or your face was in the middle of a mirror. It, was just, it just felt all the force of the sun. 
And he said you couldn't wait till it would get dark and the sun would go down. And then he said after it got dark, you would be just so cold because you were out in the water. One day it goes by. Nobody's looking for the men of the USS Indianapolis. Two days go by. Nobody's looking for the men of the USS Indianapolis. By this time, they're getting hungry. They're thirsty. Could you imagine being in the sun two full days and being so thirsty, your mouth so dry, your tongue swelling, your lips chapped, and being so thirsty and wanting a drink of water and having water all around you, but not being able to take a drink? Two days go by. Nobody's looking for the men. Three days go by. Still nobody is looking for the men of the USS Indianapolis. Nobody knows where they're at. One man in his, his book says he was a Christian. He said they gathered together. There was the uh, first day there was about 40 of them. And by the second day there was uh, a few less. And by the third day there was only about 17 of them in a circle, connected arms with their life vests uh, in a circle. And he says they would take turns praying. And as they prayed, they could feel the shark swim by their legs. Three days. Men began to hallucinate. They began to think if we just dive down, we can get a Coca-Cola. And before they just float back up to the top and be on top of the water. Eight to ten foot swells out in the water. They say they go up and they would come down. And they could see different people and they go up and come down. Three days. Some of the men thought they saw an island. They would take off swimming and a shark would devour them. Three days. Four days go by. Still nobody is looking for the men of the USS Indianapolis. The majority of their families would get letters. Your son was lost at sea. Hey, that gives a new meaning to the word lost, doesn't it? Lost at sea. But can I tell you this? The Navy did not come up with the word lost, amen? It's a Bible word. It's a Bible word. And it's a word that describes those that are without Christ. Those that are in darkness in this world. Those that have no hope in this world. See, lost is, is, is not, it's just it's what we are. It's our spiritual condition before we come to Christ. We were lost. We were without hope. We were without God. We didn't know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. We were lost. Zacchaeus was lost before Jesus passed by. Before Jesus passed by my way, I was lost. Amen. That was your condition before Jesus passed by your way. You were lost. Lost. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. But look at another phrase. Not only the word lost, but notice this. It says to seek and to save. Hey, what, what do you do when you lose your keys? You retrace your steps, don't you? You look back. You look everywhere you were, where you put them. If you lose your reading glasses, you begin uh, to go back to where you were reading last, where you had them last, where you can recall that they were, and you begin to retrace your steps. If you lose your dog, you go out on the porch and you begin to call for it. You walk through the woods uh, calling for that dog to come back. You begin to look for it. The man that had the 99 sheep and one of them was lost, what did he do? He went out in the hills and the valleys and he began to look for that sheep. And he looked everywhere for that sheep. And the Bible says that when he found that sheep, he put it on his shoulders and he walked back and he called his friends and his family and said, Hey, the one that was lost is found and come and rejoice with me and let's celebrate uh, that we found the one that was lost. The woman that lost the coin, what did she do? She moved all the... She began to sweep diligently. She looked in the corner. She moved furniture. She moved everything. And she found that coin. And what did she do? She called her friends and her family. And she said, hey, that one that was lost is found. And they rejoiced together. The prodigal son, the prodigal father, his son had left. 
He's on the he's out on the front porch. He looks down the road one day and he sees he looks he sees his son coming to him. What does he do? Does he just sit, stand there and wait for him to get there? No, he runs to him. And he embraces him. And he said, my son that was lost is found. And he brought him the robe. And he said, kill the fatted calf and let's have a feast. That which was lost is found. See, search and rescue. See, everybody always makes fun of the Air Force. They always want to know who the Air Force tough guys are. See, you have the Marines. Uh, Their motto is, once a Marine, always a Marine. Do we have any Marines in here tonight? All right, no Marines. I was with, I was with in, a, in a church, and uh, there was a Navy guy and a Marine, and they were giving each other a hard time, kind of like Brother Kidman gives me a hard time about the Air Force. But they were giving each other a hard time, and the Navy said, guy said, look at his banner out there. It says the, Na- the Marines are the Department of the United States Navy. And he was all, he said, I'll read it for you because you probably can't read. And so he read it to him. And that Marine, without a hesitation, he said, yes, the men's department. I said, I like that, amen. That's pretty good, amen. But Marines, you have the Marines. Navy, you have the Navy SEALs. We know of some of the things they've done in recent days, in recent years. Uh, The Army, you have the Army Rangers and the Green Bray. Uh, The Coast Guard, you have rescue swimmers. But then everybody says, what's the Air Force's tough guys? What are they called? Well, they're actually called PJs. Now, not what you wear to bed at night, all right? Not those kind of PJs. They're pararescue jumpers. And a pararescue jumper's mission is this. Something bad has to happen before they get involved. Usually a pilot goes down behind enemy lines, and then they're sent in behind enemy lines to rescue that down pilot and bring him back to safety. The thing I love about PJs is their creed. It says this. It is my duty as a pararescueman to save life and to aid the injured. I will be prepared at all times to reform my assigned duties quickly and efficiently, placing these duties before personal desires and comforts. These things I do that others may live. These things I do that others may live. You say, preacher, why are you going to Spain? Why are you going to minister to our Navy personnel? These things I do that others may live. Why do I give out a gospel track? These things I do that others may live. Why do I pray for missionaries and preachers? These things I do that others may live. Why do I teach a Sunday school class? These things I do that others may live. Why do I drive a van route and pick up boys and girls? These things I do that others may live. Now a pararescueman, when he saves somebody, for how long does he save that life? They're a young person, maybe 50, 60 years. That's it. And then they're going to die. But when you're involved in the Lord's work and the spiritual application, when you, when you see somebody say because you gave out a gospel tract, you witnessed, you preached, you taught them, you discipled them, for how long do you see that life transformed? For all of eternity. Listen, we can make a difference. So Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. These things I do that others may live. See, PJs will do whatever required to deny the enemy the victory and bring our warriors home to fight another day. Leave no airman, leave no marine, leave no soldier or sailor behind. These things I do that others may live. Dennis O'Brien of the United States Marine Corps said this, Only two defining forces have ever offered to die for you. Jesus Christ and the American soldier. One died for your soul, the other died for your freedom. Hey, I'm glad that Jesus left heaven and came to this earth. Amen. I don't know if we would call him a pararescue jumper, but that's exactly what he did. He left heaven and came to this earth and died on a cross for my sins. Amen. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Let's go back to the USS Indianapolis. Four days in the water. 
It was about 11 o'clock on the fourth day. A ship flew, a, a plane flew over. He was not looking for the men of the USS Indianapolis, or he was not looking for the USS Indianapolis. He was just out on a routine mission, a routine flight. He had a problem with his antenna. He told his co-pilot, he said, you take the controls. I'm going to go back and see if I can fix that antenna. So he left his co-pilot there in control, and he went back to the back of the airplane and began to look around and try to fix that antenna. And when he looked down for the first time, he seen this big oil slick. And he said, wonder what happened down there. And he seen this big oil slick that went for miles and miles. And so when he fixed the antenna and he got back up to the front of the aircraft, he took the aircraft and he went down lower, and then he could see some men in the water. And at this time, he didn't know if they were Americans or Japanese. He didn't know who they were. They were all covered with oil. And uh, he said he just got down there close by. And then he radioed for help. And he said, hey, you need to send out another plane. You need to get a ship out here. There's men in the water. So there was another airplane that came and actually landed and was able to rescue a few of the men. But there was a ship, the USS Cecil Doyle, was heading back in the opposite direction. He was heading away from where the men were. And the pilot said, listen, you need to turn your ship around and come. There's men in the water. You need to rescue them. And the captain of the USS Cecil Doyle, without any authority from the Navy, made the decision to turn his ship around and head back where those men were. He went as fast as he could go, and he told his men, give him flank speed. And uh, they, they called up a little bit later and said, listen, sir, we're going to blow the engines if we don't slow down. And he said, if they blow, they blow. We have men in the water. About 4 o'clock that day, he got some coordinates and said was to adjust his course to those coordinates. About 6 o'clock, he got some more coordinates and said, this is where the men are, adjust your course one more time. They were going as fast as they could go. About 10 o'clock that night, it was completely dark. And he slowed the ship down because he was afraid if he kept going, he would run over the men that were in the water. And so he slowed the ship down. He said, it'll have to be in the morning till we can get them, till we can rescue them. But then the captain of the USS Cecil Doyle said a command his men had never heard before. Because, see, they were in enemy waters. And when a ship's in enemy waters, nobody can even go out on the deck and smoke a cigarette. Because the light of that cigarette would identify where your ship was and make you an easy target for the enemy. And the captain of that USS Cecil Doyle said, he said, men, I want you to take that searchlight and I want you to point it towards the sky. And they said, sir, we're in enemy waters. It will be an easy target for the enemy. He said, I want you to take that searchlight and I want you to point it towards the sky because those men have been in the water long enough and they need to know help is on the way. And so those, those, those seamen, those sailors took that, uh, that, that light and they leaned that light back and they turned that light on and a beam of light went up in the sky. And those men that had been out there for four and a half days, they said when they saw that light, for the first time they realized their prayers had been answered. They realized that help was on the way. They realized they were, somebody was there to rescue them. They realized that they were going to make it back home alive and they could just hold on just a little bit longer. When I read that preacher, I got goosebumps because that's what a missionary is to do. See, it's not about going and telling them about ourselves. It's not going and telling them about what we've done or what we've accomplished or about my military career or my military experience. No, a goal as a missionary is to take that searchlight and lean it back and turn the light on and shine the light up and say, look to the light, look to the light. Jesus is the light. He's the light of the world. He's the one that can save you. He's the one that can rescue your marriage. He's the one that can save you from drug addiction. He's the one. Look to the light. Look to the light. It's not about me. It's not about these other missionaries. It's about Jesus. He's the one that said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Hey, have you ever been there? Have you ever been lost? You remember when you were lost? You remember when you were without hope? Without God? Didn't know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior. You were lost. But I got good news for you. Jesus Christ came to this earth 
And he died for you on a cross. And he shed his blood. And the third day he rose again so that you could be saved. I know what people mean when they say, I found Jesus. But can I tell you, that's unbiblical. You didn't find him. He was never lost. He found you, amen. He knew where you were. And it doesn't matter if you were here in Hurdle Mills or you were in England or wherever you were when you got saved. Jesus knew exactly where you were. The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Hey, I'm glad that Jesus passed by my way one day. I'm glad I heard the gospel. I'm glad I heard the good news. But here's what a Navy SEAL said. He said, the only thing worse than being captured is being captured and no one coming to rescue you. Listen to that again. The only thing worse than being captured is being captured and no one coming to rescue you. Hey, we live in a lost world. We live in a dark world. There's lost people all around us. You don't have to go to Spain to see lost people. You don't have to go to the veterans to see lost people. They're all around us. And they don't have any hope. They don't know God. They don't know Jesus Christ. But here's my question, church. Is anybody coming to rescue them? Is anybody taking the light and leaning it back and pointing up to the sky and saying, look to Jesus, look to the light, look to the light, look to the light. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, I pray you'd use this message tonight. Challenge hearts, do what I cannot do, dear God. I pray that you'd be at the invitation. Lord, my heart's desire, if there's one person that's lost here tonight, whether it be man or woman, boy or girl, teenager, Lord, if there's one here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, they've never asked Jesus in their heart and in their life, I pray tonight would be the night that they would come and ask Jesus Christ in their heart and in their life. But Lord, I pray, Lord, as this mission conference goes on, that we would realize that your mission was to come and to seek and to save that which was lost. And that commission you have given to the church to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Lord, help us tonight. Lord, maybe that we know somebody that's lost. Maybe we know somebody that's in darkness. Maybe we know somebody that doesn't know Jesus Christ. I pray we would come tonight and pray for that person and, and pray that God would open doors for us to witness to them and to be a light to them and point them to Jesus. Lord, do something tonight that I cannot do. Lord, I pray that you would get all the honor and the glory. It's all about you. Help us to point people to the light. And Lord, we'll thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Every head bowed, every eye closed as the preacher comes. Would you be obedient to the Lord tonight? You know somebody that's lost? You know somebody that's without hope? How many people do you know tonight that coronavirus has got them scared? They don't have any hope. They don't know what to do. Hey, could you point them to the light? Somebody in your family? Somebody in your workplace? Somebody in your school, you know somebody that's lost, would you point them to the light of Jesus Christ? Y'all stand at our feet tonight, every head bowed, every eye closed. I've asked them to come sing this song tonight. Brother Kidman, his dear wife, just sang it this morning. I think it was this morning. But while they're singing tonight, if you're in this place tonight and you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Master of your life, this dear missionary pastor has pointed the light for you tonight. He's given you the way. He's shined the light through the gospel. 
I beg you to come get around this altar. Cry out to a holy God tonight. Help is here. If you're in this place tonight, you said, Preacher, I know that they're, there, they're out there and they're lost. But Preacher, I, I've not been shining the light the way that I should. I've left them out there. And Preacher, I know that without me, they'll not be rescued. You may be that one that needs to come and gather around this altar tonight and say, God, if you would, God, if you would, would you shine that light through me that I may go rescue the lost, that I may be that light, that I may be that beam that Brother Staley was talking about tonight. How about you tonight while they sing this song, listen to the words. God, let me be that light. Listen, church. As I kneel in the darkness, middle of the night, I'm praying for assurance. Oh, Everything's going to be all right. Lord, I see another battle that's out in front of me. I'm afraid I won't be able, and I'll go down in defeat. And he said, do you remember just where I brought you from? Just take a look behind you, oh, at how far you've come. And every time you ask me, didn't I deliver you? So why would you be thinking that I wouldn't see you through? And he said, I walked on the water. I calm the raging sea, I spoke to the wind, it hushed and I gave you peace. Didn't I run to your rescue, didn't I hear you when you called? I walked right beside you, just so you wouldn't fall, and didn't I leave? all of heaven just to die for your sin I searched until I found you and I'll do it all again just before they sing this last verse I remember being lost Saved going on 36 years now. I remember the night when God shone that light through somebody in my heart. I remember where I was. I never forgot it. I remember the house I was in. I remember the chair I was in. I remember the pastor that God sit by my way at 10 o'clock took the word of God the light showed me what I must do to be born again washed in the blood of the lamb I was one of those that was lost at sea lost in the world headed for devil's hell I've never forgot that night I respect brother Bobby Tate More than any person I know of tonight outside of Jesus Christ. There's hardly a day goes by right now that Brother Bobby, the man that led me to the Lord, does not text me and encourage me. Brother Staley, he's still shining that light even after 36 years. Just a few years ago, last couple of years, Brother Bobby's been going through cancer and having a tough time. And 
I remember calling him and texting him, and I remember going by his house, and I just wanted to be that light to him that he had been to me. And I'd go by there thinking, man, I, I'm just going to go shine that light for Brother Bobby a little bit and encourage him. And I never left his home what I wasn't encouraged by him. Christian, it's up to us. They're drowning in the water tonight. What are we going to do? And when are we going to do it? To say, I'm not letting any more drown. I'm not going to let them stay in the dark any longer. I'm going to be that light in their life. That don't mean that all of them's going to receive the light. He didn't rescue all of those men. Some died. But listen, a lot of them died while they were waiting on the light. And I promise you that across the world and throughout America and throughout Hurdle Mill, North Carolina and throughout Person County tonight, there are going to be those that will die while they're still waiting on the light to shine in their life. I'm glad that he walked on the water and came to where I was. He wants us to go to where they are. Listen to this last verse tonight as I sing. It's your opportunity to come get around this. Now she's talking to her father in a house that was once a home. She says, my bills are coming due, Lord, and six days is not that long. She hears a voice so still and low It says, I've moved like that before I'll do this little thing And I'll give you so much more And he said, I walked on the water I calmed the raging sea I spoke to the wind it hushed and I gave it peace. And then I run to your rescue. Did I hear you when you called? I walked right beside you just so you wouldn't fall. And did not leave all of heaven just to die for your sin. I searched until I found you, and I'll do it all again. What a blessing. What an honor. Matthew 5, 16 says, let your light so shine. That others may see your good works. And glorify our Father, which is in heaven. Let me speak to the young people again tonight. I love you. I appreciate your faithfulness here this week. Pre appreciate those young people and those kids been coming in the morning. When I got those kids to stand up last night and beg for the gospel to be brought to them. Brother Carl didn't know that was going to happen. We had set that whole thing up and I told him that I had four or five ready that was ready to beg for the gospel for different countries, but he didn't know those kids were going to be one of them. He told me last night, he said, Preacher, you set me up tonight. He said, I was good with all those other people begging because I expected it. <laughs> he said, but when those kids stood up and started begging, I about lost it. And I was trying to get back into what I needed to be preaching. He said, but to hear the voice of those kids, it blessed his heart. Can I tell you young people something tonight? There's kids you're around all the time 
that don't have the privilege that you have right now. Their mom and dad's not in church. They don't have a godly home. They don't have a mom and dad that'll pray. They don't have a mom and dad that'll seek God over them. But what they need more than anything else is for that light to shine through you. Why? Well, they're dead in the water if you don't. If that light never shines, they're dead in the water. Think about it. I mean, young people tonight said, listen, I got friends. I don't care if they die and go to hell. How many young people willing to say that tonight? How many young people willing to throw up your hands tonight and say, Preacher, I don't care. I don't care. Live my life. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I don't care. Let them drown in the water. Not a one in here would say that. But when we don't show that light, that's exactly what we're doing. We got to go after them. They're dead in the water if we don't.